All right, welcome folks. Uh, this is our third and final uh, part to our three-part webinar series on e-commerce success stories for the value-added producer. So very excited to have folks joining us here. We're expecting more for folks to trickle in. Um, and this is also being recorded to CAS YouTube page. So if you want to forward it along to anyone, please feel free to do that um, once we share that link with folks. Um, so welcome. We're excited to spend the next hour with everyone doing some knowledge sharing about e-commerce success stories, value-added production, shipping nationwide, lots of good things um, for today's topic. Um, so some learning objectives that we'll just review quickly here for this three-part webinar series. We're learning how farms have developed their businesses to include value-added products and how they've navigated those various logistics and fulfilling those orders with e-commerce, shipping, marketing sales um, platforms and plugins, everything else that folks are using. Uh, we're going to learn marketing best strategies, learn why farms are choosing some of these systems for their business management. And we're also going to learn about a Community Alliance with Family Farmers Tech Hub and some existing resources that are available to support small farmers who are on this call today. And we encourage you to ask questions throughout this webinar series or throughout today's uh, presentation, because at the end, we're going to have question and answer. So if a question comes up for you during any of the presentation, please just feel free to put it in the chat or make a note of it. And you can raise your hand at the end or, or go off mute. Um, but please uh, feel free to add those questions as we go along. So a bit about CAF. We are a nonprofit that works across California supporting small family farms. I um, mean, our mission is our mission is to build sustainable food and farming systems through policy advocacy and on the ground programs that create more resilient family farms, communities and ecosystems. Um, so really excited to bring this knowledge to you today and to help. Yeah, just help create as many viable small farms as we can across California and our country. Some of our programs at CAF, um, in case folks aren't familiar, we have a lot of different programs that we support farmers through. Um, so we do a farm to market program, which involves a lot of institutional sales with like farm to school. And we do policy work, um, mostly in Sacramento, but uh, making sure that farmers are supported with policies and, and funding is key to this. We do a lot of work on that. We also work in ecological farming. Um, and this webinar is being brought to you by our farmer services program, which includes um, farm tech, food safety, and fire resilience. So if you want any um, support in any of these areas, always feel free to reach out to us and we can uh, refer you to the right person. Uh, so a bit about our Tech Hub. It's a newer program at CAF um, in case folks aren't familiar with it. But if you are operating out of California, we're available to provide free direct one on one support to you, um, basically like a business consultant. So uh, we've been supporting farmers with e-commerce needs, with uh, other needs, just like getting an email account set up and a Google business listing, learning how search engine optimization works, how Facebook marketplace works, Instagram. We can help you with all that stuff. Um, so if you visit our website, calf.org slash tech hub, you'll see a link to request for direct support through that. We also have resources listed there and we'll also be putting that in the chat in case folks would like to um, go ahead and request for that now. All right, now um, we wanna make sure the full webinar is dedicated as much as possible to the amazing work um, that Chris and her partner are doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce her briefly and then hand it over to her to tell us more about their operation. Um, but Carissa and Charlie Payne are first generation farmers raising meat regeneratively in Ohio. So excited to have them be presented in California. Uh, they sustainably raise chicken, pigs, sheep, and cows and ship their products nationwide. Um, and Cove Rice Farms has value added products such as bone broth, as well as honey products. They also attend farmers markets locally, and they've been very intentional about their marketing and sales decisions and have even been featured on the cover of New York Times, along with other publications and podcasts. We're thrilled to have Carissa here today to learn directly from a farmer about their successful marketing and e-commerce uh, practices. Welcome, Carissa. I'll hand it over to you now. Switched over here. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Carissa Payne and together with my husband, Charlie Payne, um, we own and operate Covey Rice Farms located here in central Ohio. Um, to give you an idea of about where we are, um, we're about 45 minutes from the city central of Columbus, which is like that, you know, huge population. We live in the outskirts of a little, um, a little suburb um, called Radnor. I wouldn't say it's a suburb, it's a little town called Radnor. We don't even have a stop sign or a stoplight. Um, there's a few stop signs around here, but I don't know how many people stop at them. 
Um, it's a really small area, but we're, we're nice because we're located near the city. So it kind of helps us offset that. So to kind of tell you a little bit about us, my husband started the farm um, as a hobby before we met in 2015. Um, he started it because he wanted a deeper connection with food. He'd read some books. Um, at the same time, before we had met, I had a, I wanted a different connection with food as well because of some health issues I was struggling with. I was beginning to ask questions of like what's in the food, how it was raised, and how it affects your body. So at the same time, in different parts of the world, we're both asking these questions, and um, we met in uh, we met in twenty. 2018. And um, at that time, the business was pretty small. He had, um, when I say small, it was still a pretty good size by then. Um, he had increased the flock the year we met to, um, to, uh, to add pigs and we raised about 6,000 chickens. So when he started, it was a few chickens and now we're, we're growing that. Um, but he hadn't done any farmer's market. So when he started the hobby to basically pay for the cost of the operations, he started doing wholesale accounts and would sell to a uh, to few restaurants around town. Um, at first, nobody was, it wasn't something he wanted to sell. He was just learning the, the tricks of the trade. Um, but by the second year, by 2016, he was selling to wholesale to some restaurants. Um, and that helped kind of cash flow. We call it the hobby, right? Um, he was still learning how to make things cost effective. Um, he didn't really know the, the quirks behind the trade. He was a kid from the suburbs. Um, but by 20, so every year he would grow his wholesale accounts. And by 20, by 2018, um, we had started farmer's markets. So the year we had met, we were still kind of small for what we are compared to today. Um, 6,000 chickens. I think we started raising a few hogs that year. Um, and we had maybe about 60 or 70 sheep. And we dabbled in a uh, 100 or so turkeys. And um, so that year, it was very, very small. We, I thought, oh, I have no idea what to expect at the farmer's markets. Will people even buy this because our price tag is so high? Um, and uh, we were blown away by the support that we had. Um, we ended up increasing our, our flock the following year by, uh, by more than double. <laughs> and um, needless to say, now we went from a few, you know, a few hundred turkeys or a few hundred chickens to now we raise about 15,000 chickens on pasture, give or take each year, about 150 hogs. Um, we do about 100 or so cow, uh, cattle. We've acquired some new land, so we're hoping to get to 150 this coming year. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it continues to grow every year. So we start small and you never know where you'll, you'll keep going as, as demand gets there. And as, as you start enjoying the, the fun, uh, the fun journey with, uh, with farming. So we both are full-time now, um, on our farm. We have a few seasonal help. We'd hoped to hire a full-time hand this year. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't work out. So if you want to make sure you find the right fit before you hire a full-time hand, because they pretty much are as a small business, they are with and live with your family, so to speak. You're with them so much, you might, they might as well be part of the family. Um, so we do have a few seasonal hands that help out and definitely help out with the chores and logistics because we do several markets at the same time, um, as well as it, every day is pretty much fully packed and fully busy. So we need the extra hands on deck. So the roles that we play in our farm, so I handle all of the marketing and the customer acquisition, um, I say the customer acquisition, the logistics of ordering, the fulfillment of ordering and um, everything marketing and in between. Um, whereas Charlie handles more of the daily chores and operations. Um, don't get me wrong, I still help out with chores, but that's definitely his area to focus um, is managing the soil health and in soil health and that type of thing. That's what kind of his background was in. So he did work for a nonprofit with soil health, um, soil health and um, soil management. So he has experience in knowing basically what animals should be where, um, what to plant, how long they should be there, how everything is growing properly. Um, so that's where his strength is at. And he also did some grant writing um, and has a degree in, uh, in business as well. So that helps him do the QuickBooks and the, uh, and all the logistics of the farm animals, whereas I am more of the customer and the people, and I handle all of that. People are definitely my favorite part of this. I don't, I don't know. I take that back. I love animals too, but people, the people and selling directly to consumers is definitely where my heart is at. So kind of going into that. So some of the tools that we really rely on is one, our website. So we use a Shopify website. Um, we are at the higher end of Shopify. And I was looking at some price points before this, and there's some on the lower end and some on the higher end. And I think we pay, we, um, we pay 238 a month to give you an idea. Um, we have two apps, I believe that we use for subscriptions, which have really helped our business grow. 
Um, subscriptions we rely heavily on each month because that's guaranteed basically income for our business. It's a way for us not to have to work as hard each month to sell those boxes. Um, it's a guaranteed resource that we have and we rely on. So we work hard to get a sustainable amount of, of Covey Club, which is our monthly subscription box um, that we can guarantee to fulfill with everybody's, meet everybody's needs. And then anything excess, we sell at farmer's markets or we sell um, online as part of our weekly specials or extra box or additives or even out of the park. Um, but we give Covey Club members first dibs on anything else. And so the one of the apps on our websites allows us to automatically bill for that. They can change the subscription whenever they want. Um, they can adjust it to every other month. They can adjust the size. So I don't have to handhold our customers anymore, which is a huge weight off my shoulders because even when we had 50, 50 Covey Clubs, it was still hard to manage 50 people because they all want to change and make things at the same time. And a lot of times you had to go on the computer to do it. But Shopify made it really easy and I just do it from my phone um, or the customer does it if they if they don't have any, um, they're able to at home. So we have some older customers that I have to do it still for them. But for the most part, most people do it for themselves online, which is, again, a time saver and it's really cost effective for us to then justify that expense every month. Um, another feature of our website is that automatically bills. So I don't have to remember to bill people which I can be bad about with me. We previously had Grace Cart, which was great when we were starting out. Um, it's the lower, it was a lower end cost and it had a template set up. So I didn't have to have as much experience into it. Um, but for me, it was remembering to bill people and um, to get those things in in time and then inventory management and logistics. Right now I do all of our order fulfillment. So I print off the orders um, from Shopify. Every time that we have a, um, every time that we do shipping or local deliveries, and I sort each one out by um, by location. Um, we use the um, UPS um, directly, their, um, their world ship site for our shipping logistics. Um, and then it's really cool because Shopify has a barcode scan, a barcode box. So like as I'm, because we don't use another app or another software, a third party to input the shipping um, information into there, we just usually manually do it. So I just usually scan the barcode of my shipping, my UPS label, and it automatically inputs it into Shopify and then it fulfills that order. So it's really nice because I can guarantee that I check that item off or that box did go out. Um, it's really handy for me to manage that. And that works really well for us. Um, in terms of social media, um, we do kind of a variety of um, different platforms. So we focus mostly on, I would say Instagram, or at least that's where we started off. Um, now we're transitioning to trying to incorporate some of Facebook as well. So Instagram is more of like a, I call it a broader reach. It's more of a, um, like a worldwide shipping logistics. If you want to focus on reaching as many people as possible in a large area, Instagram is your tool. But if you want to focus on like a geographical location, um, then Facebook's probably going to be your best bet to focus your time and your energy. Um, so we want to do both kind of in a way. So I want to, I want to focus on a specific region right now for our business um, shipping wise. So I have a location that is our most cost effective shipping option. Um, so that's where I want to make sure I get as many customers in my shipping zone as possible. Um, whereas local customers, I also want to focus on them, right? But in specific areas within the Columbus, their central Ohio area, because it's easier for me to deliver to, it's more cost effective. So that's where I'm focusing on my customer acquisition too. We've been able to allocate now where we want to, where we want to grow our reach. Whereas before when we were just starting out, we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, right? We want to get as many customers, as many sales as possible. We don't care where they come from, but just, you know, we need to, we need to sell meat. Um, which is great. But as you kind of grow your business, you want to find out what areas or what regions or what's more cost effective for to put you time and your energy to grow. So for us with Facebook, we started a way to kind of use social media to your advantage for that. We focused on like a lot of the mom groups, um, homeschooling groups and community pages. And we have found that when people ask, especially right now, which is a huge, um, huge demand for is local meats. Um, we had had customers we, uh, who would you know, recommend us um, say, oh, we need pasture-raised chicken. Well, Covey Rice Farms, have you tried them? Um, they're a great resource. And I would say a great way to ask your customers to do that is in your email newsletter or if you see them in person and they ask, what can they do to help your business? Just basically be honest with them. Like you're our own best advocate or your own best business advocate, right? So as a customer, one of our great way for customer acquisition is word of mouth. So we tell our customers, you know, we rely on you to help us grow our business. We're a small business. Our marketing dollars are limited. You know, if you really enjoy our products and you don't mind sharing it with other people, that would really, really help us. 
And we have found that 99% of the time, our customers are eager to go to bat for us. So on those Facebook groups, it's really helpful um, for them to go to bat for you, but it's also helpful for you to chime in as a producer and say, hey, I have pasture raised meat, or hey, I'm selling produce, or hey, I'm selling this, and here's my farm, here's, here's why you should buy from us. Um, putting your time and attention to that is one, people like respect that. They think, oh, they're, you know, they're attentive, they're a good resource, um, and they have a connection with you, which again, as a small business, is a great selling factor. Um, printed material is something I also want to talk about. Um, because that's a great way at some of the events that you can sell your business and promote yourself. And it's a great way to get your brand out there because brand recognition matters. So we didn't focus on early on a lot of our brandy material and I regret it. So we would go to events and not have a business card. And I'm telling you this because I don't want you to make the same mistake. Um, as we grew, we definitely quickly learned we need to have our business cards. We need to have about cards and we need to have, you know, a quick, um, why you should buy from us. And the reason why you kind of need those three things is because that's what people want to know. They want to know why they should buy from you. They want to know how to get in contact from you and they want to know who you are. And if you have those things handy, especially if even if you're at a grocery store and you make a comment about, we always engage with people, right? Um, casually and, you know, what do you do for a living or where's your farm located? You can whip out your business card. And I know it sounds cheesy, but it's an easy way to, again, for you to pass along your information to someone. So it's a, it's a cheap and a cost-effective uh, printing tool um, to go ahead and market your products. However, I wouldn't pay for publications and material if you can help it. Um, most of the time, they're not cost-effective. Um, ads don't really work even for small groups. And uh, you can put your time and your money elsewhere to get a better result. But you can basically encourage or, or you basically can ask people to help and get in your publications, like talk about your business, tell them how great you are, um, why you're a good resource and uh, have that material and that marketing material ready. And then more than likely, you're going to get a chance with some of those publications for free and you're not going to have to pay. Sometimes they even pay you. Something we started using recently, um, we always use our email and we always ask for emails and I send out an email newsletter. We use Flowdesk. I really like it. It's easy. It's pretty. People like pretty and it's easy to read. But something we've recently started using is texting. Um, it's not cost effective early on. So if you have a smaller resource, what we use is probably not cost effective. Um, I think we're at um, like $100 a month. They have a smaller branch for $49 a month. Um, so if you have depending on how many customers you have that have opted in, it could be cost effective for, for you, depending on your customer size. Um, but it may not be, it's something that you should really just run your numbers and figure out. Um, but it has been a good resource because we've noticed that unlike emails, which take gradually over time, um, with texting, it's instant people automatically go to your website and they're already, they're already ready to click and look at your specials. So it's something to keep in mind. It's a good resource for us. It's something to explore. Um, a lot of businesses are using it. It's a great way to get discount codes. It's a great way if you're shipping boxes out and you have some extra dry ice, you can tell people, hey, I'm shipping now. I still have some room left for delivery. It's a great way for instant orders. Um, whereas email sometimes, like I said, takes a little time. Um, Charlie uses QuickBooks to manage all of our logistics and all of our um, expenses. It's a great way for him to use like the, the business credit card, um, the bank account, um, all of these things at once to then basically solidify our expenses, put them all and categorize them in order. We can kind of figure out easily when we do our taxes, kind of where we're at benchmark wise, if we're making a profit or if we need to like adjust some things for that munch and pricing. Right now, it's really crucial, especially with pricing increasing um, on um, farming expenses. Adobe and Canva. So Adobe and Canva, I want to talk about because Canva is super easy to use. Anyone can use it. And Adobe is the same thing, but it takes a little time to get there. So we do all of our logos, um, our bone broth labels. We do this all ourselves in Adobe and we taught ourselves. We took some, took some YouTube videos and played with it and played around with some trial and error. And it seemed to work really well for us. Um, I think you can do it if you give it a try. Um, it's a great way to not have to pay someone to do it um, for you. It's a great way to go and design marketing material and have it handy. You can also take, most people don't know this, take templates from somewhere else um, and then add your information in there on Adobe. So you can play with the template, use a basic template offline and make it your own. Canva is great because it's great for resumes. It's great for 
slideshows. It's great for Instagram material. It's great for Facebook ads. It's great for even email marketing. It's a great way for you to take your image and really make it your own. Um, it's also great just to make you look, I guess, more professional in some capacity, right? When you depending on what area you're looking to grow that in. Um, and Canvas super, um, super affordable. The pros doesn't cost a fortune. I, if you're going to use it, it's a good investment. But if it's something that you may sit there and you may not use it, I wouldn't spend the money on it. Always look at your apps and see what, where you're spending your time and what you're using. Um, and you can always cancel and resubscribe if you decide to use it later. I would say Lightroom and Google Docs are two of my top two things that I use. We use Zoom calls for our mastermind groups that we lead, but overall Lightroom, I added all of our Instagram, Facebook, um, email photos on Lightroom. It's very easy. It's pretty much like editing on any other social media platform or on your phone. You slide things over for brightness and contrast. Um, you can play with it and it saves right to your phone. And it's, I made a note here. It's like $9.99 a month. So it's super, super inexpensive. It's something that I use every day. And they can take a basic photo and make it look pretty great. Like a professional photo, I want to say. So we as a small business like to work smarter, not harder, right? We want our tools to work for us. So make sure your website works for you. Don't take my, don't, don't take, uh, take my, uh, take, don't take my path necessarily and use Shopify if Shopify doesn't work for you. Um, there are a lot of other great website options out there. And make sure you look to see if that is something that would work best for your farm and your business. Especially when it comes to order fulfillment, because that's where like time is money. Um, I would say don't ever hesitate to ask um, for help. And that's something I have struggled with is I think I can do it all and not hire someone. And then I end up basically not fulfilling the things that I need to do, right? Or not doing them in the best way possible. So make sure you hire someone if you get to that point or ask for help, ask family members, ask friends, everybody wants to join in on the party when it comes to helping you grow your business. So utilize your resources to the best of your ability and don't forget to ask for help. Also, I wanna say invest in yourself because at the end of the day, if you're not growing and if you're not learning and adapting, neither is your business. And if your business isn't growing, eventually it's, it's going to start, you're gonna start decreasing in customers or decreasing in quality, right? We need to continue to invest in things like webinars or conferences or just recharge because as a small business owner, eventually burnout happens. You know, you work hard, you're working 24 seven, you're putting everything you have heart and soul into this business and your money. And, you know, eventually there's going to come to a point where you need to recharge. So don't forget to do that. I know I'm heading to a conference in two weeks to go to Texas. It's something, yes, it was an investment, but it's something that I know I needed for our business to recharge mentally and my creativity and all of the great stuff to help us grow our brand and our operation. So when to take that jump, right? Charlie took the jump in 2019 because I'll be honest with you, he lost his job for a nonprofit. Um, they had budget cuts. It was not expected yet. We had planned for him to have his job for another six months. Um, so it was very, very stressful this year. We were able to plan me quitting my job. Um, childcare is very expensive as you guys know, and the drive is super long, um, to my work. So I was driving over an hour there. I wasn't able to, um, fulfill all of my obligations that I wanted to for our farm. And I realized that we had to make a change. Um, it was hurting me creatively. It was hurting, you know, it wasn't great for our marriage. It wasn't great for our business and it wasn't great for my daughter. So at that point in time, we looked at the numbers. We realized, can we do this? Can we financially, you know, make this decision? So that's something to always keep in mind. Are you profitable? If you're not, can you be by you working full time or by you working full time on your farm? Um, another important question you need to ask yourself is, can you grow your business without your income? Because if you don't have your income, it's really hard to get a loan um, unless you have additional assets and stuff like that that you can lean off of. But more than likely, um, you know, you probably have a loan on your farm. You probably have a loan on equipment. Um, and it's not as easy to get a loan when you don't have a job. Trust me from experience. Um, can you support your family with your business income? So most people think, oh, great. Sales are great. I'm making $20 here. I'm making $100 there, $500. Man, we just hit $1,000 a month. This is great. That is great. Um, but when you take away all of your expenses, are you able to support your family? And that is key. And if you're not currently, can you be, can you make adjustments in your um, expenses, your house, you know, your household um, lifestyle? Can you, can you adjust some things to then make it where you can live off of income? 
And are you going to be comfortable and you're going to be content with that specific lifestyle? Um, and do you have money put back for the unexpected is the other thing I'm going to touch on because right now we're kind of living in unprecedented times and that's not to scare anyone, but that's just the reality of things. Expenses are kind of all over the board and you need to make sure that you have a nest egg put back. And by nest egg, I mean like, you know, some extra money in case something happens that you can lean on to. So that way, if you know, you're not in a pickle, um, especially if you are full time, um, you, you don't have that extra income coming in. So how to make your business stand out. This is one of my favorite topics because it sounds really hard, but it's actually really easy. So we rely on a lot of our customers. Our customers have helped us so much. So we have a customer who does marketing and he offered to help us design um, recently a referral card. But most of the time we usually do our stuff ourselves, but he offered. So we're like, yeah, sure. We'd love your help. Um, so he's helped us with that. He's helped us with some um, Google analytics. He's helped us with some you know, Facebook strategies. So using your customers is a great way to help you grow your small business because most of the time they understand your margins are you're pretty low and they support you already, right? They believe in what you're doing. We also have another customer who um, is really good and does food blogging. She was in high school when she started um, buying from us. She did the both of these photos here that you see. And guess what? She did them in exchange for meat. So meat photography on your website and photography on your website is golden. If you can afford or strategize and figure out who does photography that you know, or be willing to do it and barter and trade, that's a great way to make your business stand out. So when you go on a website and that's actually what they're gonna buy, how cool is that to know that you're, you know, that's not an image that you bought. However, you can do that. Everyone does that at some point in time, right? Um, but it's your, it's your image, it's your, it's your product, and it's easy to do. If you don't have that, if you don't know someone who does photography, if you don't um, have the resources or don't have that financial, you know, capability, I suggest my biggest advice is invest in a good iPhone. Um, the iPhone has helped me. I take all of our product photos um, that I take on my iPhone. I just did one today where I did one of a sloppy Joe and I used um, a friend of ours who's a photographer actually told me this. You can take whiteboard or like white um, poster board on the edges of your photo, kind of like this as a way to like radiant the light. Obviously you want natural light coming in, but you need white offset to help brighten it. And then I found a really cool textured poster board that I put on the bottom and then just a plain white plate. So you can do things yourself and you can get creative. Um, YouTube is a great resource. Um, I have a few other people I'd recommend following on social media that's really helpful with encouraging you to do photography yourself, um, which will allow you again to grow your business and your, and your different avenues. If you, um, the other thing too with photography is when you look on someone's website, if you see nice kind of bright photos of the family, um, of the farm, of the lifestyle of the animals, um, that also encourages you to, um, you have an insight of that family and that farm. So if you could find a friend to take photos for you, or you can fit it into the budget to have someone come photograph you for the day, I highly recommend that. That's something where I would put my money at hands down because it lasts pretty much a lifetime for your business. Um, know your audience. So how to stand out. So if you're constantly, if you're just throwing spaghetti at a wall and you don't really know who your customer is, that can hurt you in and not hurt you in the same way. Um, so basically you wanna know who, who you're selling to. And the reason why you wanna know that is, is because that's how you're gonna send out your emails. That's the kind of photos you're gonna take. That's the kind of um, writing you're gonna put out. That's the kind of interactions you're gonna have, right? These are the people that you're, you know, you're selling your product to. You wanna know why they're buying from you. Um, when we first started out, we thought our ideal customer would be someone who makes a lot of money, right? Like $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year. Um, they would live in some fancy house and have a great kitchen to cook in. That's who we thought our ideal customer was because we thought our price point was kind of high and we didn't know if everyday people could afford it. It turns out we were really wrong. <laughs> I would say most of our customers are average median income, um, middle class, uh, middle class Americans, basically making sacrifices in their budget um, to afford our food because they believe in sustainability. So now we know our ideal customer is someone who wants to know where their food comes from, who cares about their food, um, likes to eat, um, very passionate about cooking, um, usually a family, but not always necessarily. We have a carnivore type of, um, type of group too that really likes our organ meat. 
But overall, it's usually families who really want to know their farmer. That's usually our target audience if we were appealing to. Um, so something for you to think about when you're, you know, when you're starting to market, when you're asking these questions, look at the customers who currently buy from you and kind of start to ask the question of why they buy from you, why they support you. What are the, some of the characteristics they have? Usually it's probably not income. It's usually what they believe in or what, the reason why they're buying. And don't let competition put you down. Let it fuel and drive you better. Um, I used to get kind of discouraged, I'll be honest with you, when someone else at farmer's market would be, you know, have a long line or have a great display. And at the end of the day, I realized the reason why I was, you know, maybe feeling a little insecure from the competition was because maybe I wasn't putting my best self forward. So at that point in time, instead of me shutting down, I decided to say, hey, I can do better. You know, I can I can make a better sign. I can put my tent or I can get a nicer, you know, nicer tent or I can clean this up or I can make things look a little differently. Or I can look at some articles and figure out some marketing strategies. There's always ways to fuel your, your competition, right? And at the end of the day, there's limited farmers out there compared to the number of population. So that's the other thing to keep in mind, right? Let it fuel you to be your best self. But at the end of the day, like still be friends with that farmer because there's very few of us out there compared to the mass population of growing people. And that's something that we keep in mind too, that there's the amount of, if we had even, I don't know, 1% of the entire Ohio population to buy from us, it, we wouldn't be sustainable. Like <laughs> we couldn't provide for all of them, right? There's just, it's a large portion. So keep that in mind. Don't let competition put you down, but let it fuel you to be your best self. Our rules to live by, and this is something that we, Charlie and I both push, push each other on, is you're already at no. So you can ask to be on a podcast, you can write to a newspaper, you can um, reach out to an event space, you can reach out to another business and ask to partner with them. The worst thing they can say is no, right? There's nothing else bad that can happen to you by just asking the question. Um, the next thing is be your own best advocate. So like with our shipping rates, we always negotiate. When I get a price for something, even if it's from another small business, I try and negotiate that right down because I'm my own best advocate and I'm going to have my own best interest at heart and my business. So I'm going to advocate for the best possible rate. I'm going to advocate for the best possible result for my business at all times. And I'm going to get scrappy. So when we tape boxes, if you ever taped anything, you know, at the end of your role is a, um, a piece of, it's kind of like cardboard still stuck to tape-ish. Um, it's at the end of the roll. I save every one of those still to this day. And on my back of my boxes that I get returned, I put that over any of the cracks or anything. If I have a hole in my box, I put that over there and I tape over it and you can't tell the difference and it saves that box. So figure out ways to get scrappy. Um, do photography for yourself. Um, basically, at, you know, ask to be featured. Um, make your dollar go as far as possible. Take other opportunity you can, because even if it's for someone that has a, a less following, a smaller business, or is just starting out, every connection matters, and you never know where those people will lead you to, and know when to say no. So that's something I think we have all struggled with, is we all want to say yes to every opportunity possible, and early on we can, right? We want to take every chance we can get, but if it comes to a point in your business where you're not your best self, um, and you're not providing the best service to those individuals, um, then it's when you kind of had to put a stopping point and a break on and be like, well, maybe not yet, but maybe in the future. And document from your business. So depending on where your business starts, I want you to take a look from the very beginning, which is what I did here. And this, this lovely food photography picture, which I was so proud of in the moment I still remember to the day. So just the other day when I snapped this picture and I look at the quality difference and both were just this one, I put the 2018, I put a lot of time and effort into it. And I was so proud of. Um, and in the 2021 picture, I literally just snapped some sitting eating my food. Um, it was in a dark kitchen and I still figured out a way to make it light. And it wasn't, like I said, they're not, the one on the right isn't super great, but it, it just goes to show me like how, how much, um, our business has changed and how much it's grown. And when you're having a hard day as a small business, you know, it really hurts. You know, you can be drained down by expenses or just by, you know, things breaking or life happening and at the end of the day, like a way to refuel or refire or relight your fire as a small business owner is to look back and see how far you've come. And sorry, I was reading the comment there. So on top of selling your product, you have more to offer. And 
we all love extra ways to make money. So as you're just starting out, you're limited on acreage, you're limited on the amount of animals you can have because you don't have the extra income to buy it or you don't have the land or you don't have the resources. You can't grow that portion of your operation. That doesn't mean you can't grow your business. You are more than just the products that you sell. You can have added value things. So if you want to host events on your farm, it doesn't have to be fancy. Like the camping thing is a great resource for us. We don't, we haven't transitioned to on-farm events yet because if I'm being honest, we don't, we didn't have the time to manage it and upkeep it. And our farm isn't as pretty as I would like just yet, but um, we are working on hopefully hosting a um, pigs with pumpkin again this year where people will pay us to bring their pumpkins out and to feed our pigs. People loved it when we first did it and I'm hoping they'll love it again this year. Um, another thing is a picnic on the farm, which we hope to launch this fall um, when our farm store opens and people to come out, basically just pay to have a picnic on the farm and bring their family, play some yard games and just enjoy the nice quiet lifestyle. Um, you can do that on your farm. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, if you have sunflowers or you have a, a field or even just a, a pretty landscape where photographers can come take pictures at, um, advertise that on some of those Facebook forms for photographers in your area because most people will pay to come take photos with a pretty landscape because most of the parks right now or at least around us are crowded um, and there's not good places that are not crowded with other photographers to take pictures, especially family photos. And you don't have to do any work. It's literally just make sure the grass is mowed, it's still pretty. And um, photographers set up sessions for like $50 every 20 minutes or so. And you have a full day of uh, pretty pictures uh, for families and a great way to, again, promote your brand and grow your business. Um, experiences are another great way. Um, so if you can get on um, some public speaking events for like some small, um, some small conferences, those are always a great way to start out. Um, always promote yourself. Um, and basically if you want to speak at an event, reach out to them because they're not, I mean, the chances of them reaching out to you, they may, they may not, but if, if you reach out, at least you have a better chance of getting into that conference. Um, affiliate links. I use these, um, for our baby formula. This is one of the photos they featured on, um, for, um, I think it was, um, a sustainable ag day, um, of reusing things. So I put change in our, all of our bobby cans and my husband uses them for parts. Um, part storage, but basically any product that you use, you can get an affiliate link for. So if people want to know, oh, what is the, you know, what are you using in that picture? Or what, what do you think the best bibs are or what, what boots hold up the best? Nine times out of the 10, there's an affiliate link and you might as well get credit for, um, for that product that you're promoting. Um, like I said, we do it for Bobby. We have a, um, we have an agreement with Gallagher where we promote um, Gallagher products. Um, I will say as a farmer and a small business, we only promote things that we stand by 100%. Um, Gallagher is something we used before we worked with them. Um, I will recommend Gallagher hands down every single day. Their, their customer service has been great for us and so is their products. Um, but if there's another product you believe in, figure out a way to get an affiliate code, reach out to them. Um, so it's a great way, again, to, to, get, to pay for your products and your resources and make extra money. Um, consulting. If you have a skill set, if something you specialize in, this is something that Charlie and I joked with because we both struggle with, you know, wanting to charge people. Um, but it came to the point where people were asking us questions 24 seven. And I was like, I'm answering the same question over and over again. Um, I wonder if people would pay for this. Um, we're putting a lot of time and energy into helping them. Right. And, um, lo and behold, people will pay for good resources. So if you have a skill set, you have a knowledge, even if it's fencing, if it's fixing, um, fixing, you know, certain pieces of equipment. If you are really grow good at growing microgreens or building a certain chamber, like people will pay for that. Um, put together some material and promote yourself. The worst thing people will do is not buy it. The best thing they will do is make you extra money, um, and help pay for your time and your knowledge. Know your value and how you can monetize it kind of goes into that. Um, everything has value if you, if you make it right, you put the time and energy into something, you can make some extra money on it. So everything from using the extra products from your, um, your pigs that you have, you can make soap. If you reach out to some of the, um, the butcher shops that have leftover, um, tallow, you can buy excess tallow and lard from butcher shops. Most of them don't use it. And I think that you're crazy for probably asking for it, but you can make, um, tallow bonds. You can make, um, uh, lip balms, you can make fast scrubs, you can make anything basically out of things that people are going to throw away. 
And it's a very low cost, um, high margin kind of business. We did this with our bone broth recently, whereas our chicken backs were something that we could not um, move as well. We moved some in our chicken feet, but it wasn't as much as we'd have liked. Um, we reached out to a third party who makes broth um, here in Ohio, and they were able to offer us a USDA inspected label, ready to go bone broth pouch, which we can ship. Um, it ships very, very well. We have less cost into it because instead of packaging our backs up in individual packages for retail, we they package them in a, we call it a commercial style where it's just basically a bulk bag in a box um, with all the backs in there. And they do not charge us to package um, the backs um, or process them. So basically it's just our, our cost to raise that chicken for the, for the bones. Um, and then we have a pretty good profit on that. So that was a way for us to move chicken backs, which we were not selling. It's an added value. It's something that we had to pay a little bit for, but had a higher return on it than it would be if we were just to sell the chicken backs. Um, I know some other farms have done it with seasoned or um, spiced wings or drumsticks, which is a great way to move odd cuts. Um, we recently did dog bones and smoked those on the smoker, um, a dog bone, which most people would not want to buy, or we would just not ask from the processor cost me really nothing to get back from the processor. And, um, you know, we're selling the large ones for 19 and the small ones for, um, for 10. So it's a good margin when you don't have little costs into it and it helps make up for, um, you know, for additional costs within cattle as, you know, grain prices go up and all that stuff or your operational grows or um, cows go up or, you know, anything that goes into it, into your cattle uh, or any other products. And we also do it with our pork femur bones, which is really helpful. Our dogs love them. We feed them to our dogs, just like frozen sometimes in the summertime, but we decided to smoke them for our customers. And I was amazed by how many people wanted them. Um, we're thinking about doing a primal blend to mix in some of our organ meat, which is a great, other, another great resource. And you can also dehydrate some of your organ meat too, um, for dog treats, which again is fairly simple. You basically just dehydrate them, um, put them in nice packaging, follow your, um, follow your state's regulations and they're easy to sell. And they again, have high margins. Um, it's just the extra time that you have to put into it. So my best advice for any farm out there is that, um, you have equity and you have sweat equity and as a small business, your equity may be low. You may not have as much extra resources to put into your business financially, right? Um, but your sweat equity can be as high as you want it. That that threshold or that income, that you know, income of sweat equity is endless because the amount of time and the amount of soul and energy you want to put into your business. So if you want to take your business to the next level, you can do it through sweat equity in numerous ways. Yeah, you have to have a little bit of income to get it started, but at the end of the day, you know, time goes a long way and so does your your creativity. So invest in yourself, invest in your business and uh, just don't stop. Don't stop giving up. And that is, I think all I have here. Hopefully that was helpful for everyone. Um, like I said, it's amazing for me to look back and see how far our business has grown from 2018, even till today. You know, we, uh, to give you an idea, we sold a small um, 14 acre farm. And before the pandemic, we sold our farm, not knowing it would sell so fast, had no house to go to, lived in our camper on our new farm of 70 acres and put everything we had heart and soul into this business. And there were times that year where it was the wettest year on record. And I thought, did we make the right decision? What are we doing? And we just kept going, right? And that investing and working harder and working harder. And as each year has went on, it's amazing to look back and see how far we've come. So I am so impressed and inspired and motivated and all the things. So just thank you so much for sharing all of that. It was like a lot, you know, of like different examples. And I feel like there's so much more um, to go off of with each example. So I know I have a few questions, um, but we have a few people on the webinar today. Um, Pork Rain, uh, Federica and Connie, if you guys have any questions, please please um, chime in. And yeah, we are, oh, I see you want to go. We will um, stop share so we can look at the panelists here just for a minute. Um, thank you for that. So just a request to go off the screen share. Um, so yeah, any questions from, from folks who are on today? Can you hear me? Yeah. How are you, Chris? I'm good. How are you? I feel like I'm seeing you in person. This is like, this is crazy. 
<laughs> Instagram buddies. I uh, know, right? Man, uh, well, before I, I just so so much, just just so much, <laughs> so much. Um, how, how's the baby doing? She doing good? She's good. She's good. She's growing. She loves meat. She probably eats that more than anything else. She's good. <laughs> yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, with that being said, um, just bravo. Bravo. Just seriously. Bravo. Um, <laughs> I am amazed. Uh, some things that I've been thinking about for my business. You talked about texting service. I didn't realize yes. uh, the immediate response. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Genius. Ugh. So, you know, again, taking notes. Um, Canva, I use Canva in a lot of any type of marketing that I'm doing, even with video editing. And I think I paid like 49 for a year or something like that, or 149. But for what I'm trying to do, it works perfectly. Um, so awesome on that. Then you talked about just the overall professionalism that a lot of farmers need to have. I think that's something where we uh, struggle in is being professional. You go to some of the farmer's markets and especially with people who do meat and you'll come and they have a coolers in the back, just the regular, you know, igloo coolers and not even a, a blanket for their table, just a regular white tabletop, no signage other than something that says buy our meat. And I've seen not only through your social media posts, but also through just your overall marketing, how you really do value presentation because even when you're not able to speak, someone's gonna look at you before they hear anything that you're saying. Uh, so I, it just, I just, oh, just like, yes, y'all go. <laughs> Um, all right, so now that I'm done fangirling, uh, I did have some questions and I'll do just kind of one at a time uh, if someone has a question in between that. Uh, one thing that I, I want to talk about was profit margins. Uh, so when I teach people about price and ask them, what do you think price is? A lot of people will simply say, oh, it's, it's your cost. And I'll say, is there anything else? Well, no, it's just, no, it's just your cost. And it's like, no, 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 no. Because even if you're doing it at cost, you're not making any money. So I'm Correct. curious, to know, like, how do you navigate through profit margins? And um, what what is your profit margins for um, your different enterprises or as a whole? Like, what are you guys doing for that? So we strive, and Charlie does more of the, I would say, the math end, because he does, like I said, he has a business degree. That's where his focus is. But I know we strive for 10%. Um, 10% um, profit margin. That's our goal. It's not a, it's not a ton, but in business, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good threshold to set your set for yourself. Um, and just kind of large picture, people would realize that means if you have a million dollars in sales, that means you're only making a hundred thousand um, dollars. It's not, I know I, when it's a family of four, you know, it starts it's like, whoa, man, that's not really that much. Like you think your sales are really great, right? You're reaching that you know, a hundred thousand, 200,000, you're like, man, I'm getting rich doing this. And you start looking at the numbers and it's like, nah, <laughs> we're not getting rich just yet. We're, we're maybe paying the bills. Um, so something to keep in mind too, like where I know we're, we're hoping to double our sales by next year to be able to, again, provide better support for our family. We've been able to reduce our costs, thankfully this year. Um, you know, besides our farm mortgage, we live in an apartment where we pay $500 a month or 550 a month. Um, it's a studio apartment. It's literally five minutes from our farm. I think our electric bill might be sixty dollars. We have no, we have no trash here. We have um, well water. You know, we're living, we're living pretty humbly. So um, that's something to keep in mind too. That you can, if you can kind of reduce some of your costs, you can kind of make it worth your while. But know how much you want to make, and then kind of. I always, when people are doing the math to figure out what their price is or what their goal is as a business, I always say, figure out how much money you want to make and then work backward at figuring out what you have to price things at and where you have to go. So hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> you go, girl. You go, girl. <laughs> um, I think Federica has a question. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask another question after she's done. Hey, can Great. you go up mute? Oh, there she goes. Yeah, thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm driving. Um, conflict. Anyway, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, going down this um, line of profitability and job costing and species costing, um, you mentioned your husband does all the QuickBooks. 
but you also use Shopify. And I wonder how you, I'm wondering how you integrate these. Do you uh, re-enter all of the Shopify um, sales also? So in QuickBooks to have them all in one place so that you can do your analysis that way? Or do you export to Excel spreadsheets and do your analysis partly from the uh, platforms that give you that information and partly from the, the reports from QuickBooks for the sales? Could you describe that process a little bit? Um, yeah. That it seems to be a problem with a lot of farmers where they're like, oh my God, you want me to enter everything that's in Shopify into QuickBooks? um as well and or how do i bring them all together so yeah so shopify the deposit basically the way the shopify works is at each each month there's a deposit uh, and that's linked to our quickbooks where it then sees all the transactions for our financial accounts and then it's labeled as income from the um from online sales so we have a way because we also use square um we have a way to see how much we've made through farmers market sales and through online our online sales um, if we wanted to see how much we were making and do an analysis between local and shipping, um, I can go into Shopify and run a report that basically will tell me how much or how many how many people are in the local, excuse me, the local region versus the shipping region, and then I can differentiate the two. And could you differentiate between the various cuts or the various species of animals that you're selling? Yeah. You can, I mean, you can go through and see how much you're selling of like they can even tell you how much you're selling of each product. Like I can tell you. Um, like certain bundles that have done the best, I can tell you, I can run, I, I can run a report to, to differentiate. I have to play with it a little bit, but you can usually see where you're, um, what products are selling the most of. And do you then merge that with the information that's only in QuickBooks from the local invoices, or do you just do keep them separate? Um, I don't merge that into QuickBooks, no. I mean, for QuickBooks, it's just managing basically the financial portion of how much money I'm making. I mean, I go, I already determined my price and my, my cost into a, into a separate, like our business plan. Um, so I already know like what those expenses are versus like QuickBooks is more so of like the amount of money that's going into there and our other expenses. And then I guess our Excel sheet is differentiation between each animal. And then it's just more of like a collaborative. Like I look and see how much our feed costs for that month or how much the, how much bedding we use or how much propane we use. And then we calculate it in our cost analysis or our profit margin. I mean, overall, we kind of do an average of 10% per, um, or 10 percent overall. Okay, so you do merge Square and Shopify in spreadsheets outside of QuickBooks. No, I mean not the not what we sell. No, I don't. I mean personally, I don't. I don't really. I don't go into the, the weeds of like how much we sell each one. Like um, when we use Square, when we use Square at Farmers Market, I just enter in how much it is. I don't determine how much product I sell. I mean, I know how much I have in cold storage and how much I'm moving. So that kind of, I don't. I don't personally look in the weeds of figure out each where I'm selling the most of each product at. Okay, okay. If thank that you. answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and that, just to uh, build on that, your Shopify plan that you have, which one are you paying for? And then QuickBooks, are you guys using the online version and then a certain level for that too? Do you mind sharing which platforms they actually, or the, you know what I mean? The, yeah, I don't the, know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know offhand what QuickBooks he uses, um, but I know like we have the $79 plan I know we have two apps that um, that cause our Shopify to go up to two thirty eight fifty. Um, so we do a subscription app, um, uh, the one subscription app, and then I think there's additional fees associated with the subscription app depending on how many you're you know you're using. Um, but that subscriptions are a great way to grow your business because it's at, it's consistent income every month usually, and it's some of your most loyal customers. So it's you don't have to work as hard to sell that product. And then I think Square so. Something I didn't talk about, which is really helpful, is we use Square Marketing too. Um, for those who just do farmers markets, um, it's fifteen dollars a month, and I think you can read, and it goes up to. I think we're at twenty five now. It goes up to like five hundred and some people. Um, but basically, you can then send out emails to all the people who run their credit card. You don't have to have their email. So anyone who's ran their credit card at your farmers market, you have their email through Shopify. They won't give you the exact email, but you'll have. They have it in the backlog or some way where you can send them an email, um, basically encouraging them to come to farmer's market that day as so you have specials going on, or if you have like um, extra product, something you want to move, you can push it through that email just to your, uh, you know, your farmer's market customers. That's great to know. Thank you. Yeah. Then, yeah, I think we got another question. 
Uh, just really quick before we go back to you, um, Pork, um, what was, are you re using Recharge for your Shopify subscription app, Krista, or which one? We use Bold. Um, we tried Recharge and I had a lot of issues with it. I really like Bold. Um, it allows them to change the, um, the box size. It allows them to change when they want the box. Um, it's hard for us to manage with local customers because they're going to pay shipping and there's no way for us to add in discount codes later on. Um, so that's been something we've had to troubleshoot and work with because um, they wouldn't necessarily pay shipping. So we, the way we do it now is that everyone pays the same fee, including shipping. Um, and then local customers get extra meat to cover the, the shipping that they pay um, because we give free delivery to local customers. Thanks. And we can go back to um, Pork if you had more questions. <laughs> I'm guessing that's a pseudonym there, Pork Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, so a bunch more questions. Here we go. Uh, livestock feed, inflation. How, how y'all handling that? I, I want to, I'm curious to know. Paying, what... the bill, paying the bill and covering our eyes. <laughs> hoping <laughs> it comes down. <laughs> We're being honest right now. Um, we, we're hopefully getting our grain bins up. They've worked with us to reduce, to keep the cost somewhat low. Um, in all honesty, we were looking at the margins and non-GMO and conventional aren't, they're not far off. Um, you know, we had just tried to discuss, would we have to, you know, go down to traditional fee just because we can't raise our price. There has to become a threshold, right? Where our customers can't afford it anymore. Um, but it's pretty much the same price as non-GMO. We use a local co-op, um, which helps because they're really, they're pretty much next door and where the feed's made and it's, it comes from is I think an hour or so away, it's not very far. So we don't have the additional freight that comes in with it, which has been helpful. Um, we use a lot of bulk feed, which again, helps save the cost. Um, and we do a lot of things in the fall too, to help with the additional cost. So we do any pumpkins we get, our cold storage gives us like any rejects products, like um, like frozen food, or not frozen foods, I would say, but like um, vegetables or anything like that, that they have excess that gets rejected on a pallet, we get that. So we've been feeding it to them too to help with the additional um, with the additional cost. We're baling more hay too, if that makes uh, <laughs> makes you feel better. We're getting picking up more acres to then feed more hay to then help you know provide additional supplements. So I mean, it's we're we're figuring out we we did the cost analysis of if it would save us more money this year to feed, grind it grind our own feed, and unfortunately, it's not with diesel prices and then the wear and tear on our equipment, it wasn't cost effective for us. So we're still going to be buying in bulk and then hopefully get our grain bins up soon. Awesome. Awesome. Oh man, this, yeah. is, this is exciting. Um, you know, uh, one thing that I've noticed with doing consultations for new and beginning farmers, uh, those who are just getting started now or those who are thinking about it, uh, I, I've almost had to wrestle with, folks who are were homesteading and they were feeding their animals organic feed, certified organic feed. And they're like, oh, we just want to create the best product for our customers. And I'm just like, okay, let's, let's scale that for a minute. If we're having 20 pigs that you want or 500 uh, broiler chickens, you know, how much is your feed bill going to be at that point? So for y'all, did was there ever a point where you were like, should we, is changing our feed ration or what we're feeding our animals, uh, is, it a, is it a compromise on your values when it comes to feed? Like, have you had that conversation before with anybody, even yourself? Yeah, so we've discussed between obviously non-GMO and conventional, um, just because of my husband's background in conservation and like and his background just within um i would say the science portion of it and growing growing up like within some so like kind of veterinary medicine kind of kind of so to speak he um he really likes non-gmo um he doesn't like the he doesn't like anything that's um that changes the the mechanisms the way the crops grow um however we did look in the cost of being a consumer afford it um but in terms of organic like we did the math and it would literally double our feed cost and if our feed costs double so does our price double. And we already have people, when you set your price, I mean, obviously you wanna make sure that you're making a profit, right? And it's a sustainable, but you also have to ask yourself is at what point in time can people be able to pay that? Um, so you're gonna have, you're always gonna have a, small, a portion of your customers who are like, oh, that, that's too high or I can't afford that. Um, 
But if the majority of people are saying, I can, I, I'll make do, I can afford that, then you're at a good point. But if more, if over half your customers saying, I can't afford that, and I can't buy it, you're, you know, you're too high. And I, organic, we can't, where we're at, we can't justify it. And especially like we can't justify soy free. Um, where we're located, we can't get it in. Um, so it's not, um, it's not an option for us. And I think that based on location too, I would always say, look at your location, figure out where you are and what's cost effective for you. Cause for what's cost effective in, in California may not be cost effective in, you know, Vermont. Yeah. Thanks for going over, um, those details and yeah, great questions, everyone. I wish we had more time, but we, um, uh, we have our stopping point here at one 30. So unfortunately we have to wrap it up, but um, just want to thank you again, Chris. I feel like there's a lot more information I'd love to um, share in like a written document, maybe on like all the systems that you guys are using. So I want to follow up on that and see if we can maybe just have just like a list of like all the apps you're using and what their costs <laughs> are. Cause I think that would be really helpful for yeah. folks. Um, awesome. Thank you. So we'll, we'll hopefully get to put that together and then maybe include that on your, on the YouTube link and our resources page and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, just a reminder, um, what, you know, was shared earlier was like ask for help. And, um, we do have a USDA grant here to provide free services to farmers. Um, unfortunately you have to be in California for the grant, but, um, we are here to help just kind of like maybe walk through what some of those options are, what makes the most sense for you. Um, sharing tips and tricks from other farmers who are maybe dealing with a similar challenge. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us through our website and um, through this link that you see here. We also had it in the chat. Um, and yeah, we just can't thank you all enough for your time. And thank you for sharing all your expertise and knowledge. I am so impressed with just the growth that you've experienced in the last three years or so, or however long it's been. It's just like, really like congratulations on that. Um, so thank you again. Um, we have our slide here for our CAF uh, mailing list. If you'd like to subscribe, you can get updates on future webinars, other events happening, other resources, different stuff going on in the small farm community. Um, and yeah, just thank you for attending. So thank you again. Um, and this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you.